Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to the session. Thank you for coming, everyone. Uh, I'm going to be telling you about um, this work uh, that is joined with Santiago Torres, who's hitting rising here, and James Robinson uh, on contestation of political power in Latin America. There are some friends here who saw this work a month ago. We took to heart many of your comments. They are not here yet, not because we don't like them, just because we're working on them. So I might say at some point the things that we're doing and the directions that you suggested, just so you know that we don't have new stuff there. So if I were to raise this question, how contested is political power in Latin America, perhaps uh, several of you might say, well, you know, Latin America is a country with a huge concentration of economic and political power. But if you look at the region recently, you definitely see that there are some different faces getting to power. Uh, uh, these are just some notable examples that you would easily recognize, but that's true also if you look at how many women presidents have been elected or presidents from different ethnic backgrounds. Uh, so, you know, there has been, at least anecdotically if you look at this, some entry of different um, sorts of people into, the, into, the, uh, into uh, accessing political power. Now, there are also some clear indications of this turnover of political power. If you look at the work of, of Ben Marx and Vince Pons and Rolle here, uh, in which they have collected data on electoral turnovers for many countries and many regions, you see that it has been increasing the electoral turnovers in many of the regions, but actually in Latin America earlier and faster and, and, and in, a, in a larger amount. So Latin America does seem to stand out as a region that has uh, in experienced increasing turnover in political power uh, over this period. Uh, as I said, this is probably not what one would have expected. This is a disruption with the, with the past. Um, there are several uh, telling examples of that. I'm bringing you here the case of the 14 families of, Sal of El Salvador controlling much of the economic and political power of the country. Uh, and the one that uh, Chico Ferreira already ruined the novelty of this because he presented this during his talk, uh, which is basically the work of, uh, um, um, of Stone looking at uh, the bloodline of the Spanish conqueror Juan Vázquez de Coronado with an astonishing 31 presidents and 285 deputies uh, being able to be uh, part of, traced, traced back to, to, to this guy. So, you know, clear, strong, um, persistent of political power historically, but now we see these changes. Um, aside from these changes, the region also has a number of things to show in terms of uh, economic development and other forms of political development. Uh, there's been structural change with the running away of the agricultural sector, there's been massive expansions of democracy and the end of dictatorships, there's been more inclusive constitutions that emphasize rights, recognize indigenous peoples, recognize minorities, uh, there's been a, an expansion of education, there's uh, a more active uh, civil society has emerged. So one can mention a, a number of things in the region that seem to go in, in the direction of inclusiveness, openness, and with that also uh, increasing some measures of economic development. Now, inequality has been persistently high, despite all of this. There's something special about inequality as an outcome, or perhaps as a symptom of an underlying set of structural issues that we haven't been able, haven't been able to solve, that has been persistently um, uh, sticky despite, uh, despite all the other changes. So why might Latin America be so persistently unequal despite political inclusion and despite some major economic advances? And you could think of two complementary explanations. One is that democratization has been insufficient uh, to deliver policies because it might be captured. And there's one story that it might be captured by pre-democratic elites. And some people have done work on this, uh, on the importance on, on pre-democratic elites uh, trapping or capturing uh, then the democratic institutions. It could also be captured or um, distorted by new elites, as in, say, Robert Mikkel's uh, uh, traditional iron law of oligarchy idea in which you have new faces, but they are setting or facing a set of incentives or a set of situations that make them replicate, replicate the, the kind of things that uh, other elites were doing before. Now, this thing has to, this thing has to be complementary with some structural factors that are actually enable this to happen. So uh, while democracy may, may have arrived, other factors may directly set incentives that limit the adoption of good policies. Uh, in the case of Latin America, clientelism has been very often one feature of the political system that has been highlighted. Uh, or not necessarily that they directly uh, distort policies, but that they create, facilitate, or incentivize the capture of either new or, 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 or old elites, therefore distorting the policies. Now, the figures that I showed you before suggest that captured by all the elites doesn't appear to be or, or is hardly the whole story because there are new elites centering. 
So perhaps this idea that many of us probably had that this, the, the same old elites capturing the political system needs to be more nuanced. There's something else hoping, having, ha, 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 happening. And we're going to sort of show some just suggestive figures uh, that mm, kind of explore these other channels, and in particular these, these uh, mechanisms that go along the lines of the iron law of oligarchy. And we're going to look at more evidence from the case of Colombia. So before I tell you about the iron law of oligarchy, just let me show you that Colombia, uh, like the rest of Latin America and the examples that I showed, has experienced significant entry of new uh, forms of political actors into the uh, political arena. The number of parties in Colombian movements increased dramatically since the 1991 constitution, so much so that we were very worried that we had created uh, too many political parties, and uh, there was a reform that tried to cut that down, and it did so, but the trend uh, then reemerged at a lower level, but this made an increasing trend. And perhaps more interestingly, these new parties, these new people, are really new in the sense that they represent traditionally excluded minorities. In the Colombian case, yes, we have had elections for so many years, we have had a democracy, but it's a democracy in which the political, the, the traditional conservative and, um, and liberal parties for many, many years had a power sharing agreement, and these parties didn't represent the whole of society. In fact, many people ascribe part of our conflict uh, issues to le uh, leaving out uh, many forms of, um, or many groups. Uh, in society out of uh, political power. So you can see the increased representation of Afro Colombian parties, indigenous parties, ex militia parties, Christian parties, peasant parties, women parties. Okay. Now, it's not only that the parties exist, it's that they have been able to grab power at the local level, particularly. We're going to exploit variation at the local level. And you can see here the amount of mayors um, and councils uh, and the seats won uh, by these different uh, parties. And you see an increase. So these new type of parties of traditionally excluded groups have been able to get a higher share of power locally. Now you may say, well, yeah, it's, it's, but they might not be that different uh, uh, to start with. They might just uh, bring in the same policies. We did this exercise very much inspired by what Ken Squash Shapiro popularized with their work on, on, on newspapers and, and, um, and uh, sort of a slant of the newspapers in, in, in the US, in which they looked for distinctively uh, kind of democratic uh, terms, and others that are clearly markers of, Repu of, of Republican uh, politicians. So things that are very often said by the Republicans, but not by, uh, by Democrats, and vice versa, really mark which group you belong to. So we did the same. We created this chi-squared statistic to look at which words in legislation by these newcomer groups, where newcom newcomers are simply politicians who had never been in office and arrived to, the, to, the, to Congress, which words are distinctively of newcomers in their pieces of legislation that they propose, and which words are distinctively non-newcomers. And you can see that, actually, it's a different set of words. They are bringing different sets of issues to the table. And one thing that I love here is the fact that the non-newcomers, so these traditional people, are really worried about celebration honors and movements. And going back, to, going back to clientelism, if you look at what celebration honors and movements often is, it's like, I found out that Simon Bolivar once slept in this little town in Santander. Let's make an honor to this little town that welcomes Simon Bolivar, and therefore we have to build a stadium, we have to do something like that, and we send some money. And so, you know, every politician knows that that's one, one of the tokens of clientelistic exchanges. Uh, whereas newcomers are thinking about the environment, social security and health, um, welfare and poverty, public administration. So they are bringing new things. Uh, moreover, they are bringing not only the turnover that I mentioned before, these new groups, but it, it has become different to get in, uh, more difficult to get entrenched in power. We are, hearing, we, are, we are seeing here different generations of congressmen, and we are plotting how many additional periods they are elected on the horizontal axis, and then on the y-axis you can say, see the share of congressmen. And you can see that as we move uh, to, sort of, so to speak, younger and younger cohorts, they spend much less time in Congress. It's much harder to stay longer in Congress. So there's really, there's a true fluidity here. There's a true entrance of different people, of newcomers. The newcomers are different. They cannot stay so long. Uh, and um, the last picture that I want to show you is I've been focused on the side of politicians. And of course, they are influenced by what voters do. But also, you think of citizens. Citizens seem to have been more engaged also in Colombia, uh, not just through voting, but they have been more active uh, in the street, in collective action. We see an increased share of protests in Colombia. And interestingly, when you break these by topics, they are in the streets claiming for rights and, 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 and for the things that they are entitled to. So that, I think, is also very telling. Okay.
Now, very fluid, inclusion, you know, the dream of a, of a political economy is this should, you know, show up in great outcomes. And then I look at outcomes here on newcomers, uh, people who had never had an office before, uh, they arrive to a local mayorship, and how do they do? Well, they don't do great things. I mean, there is sort of an increase. This, these, by the way, are indices of several outcomes so that we don't pick and choose, uh, and that we classify into different dimensions. And you can be sort of optimistic about some effects here in education. There was something on public services, but it doesn't really uh, last too much. Uh, on the other things, it seems like really noise. And, you know, uh, this is from just an, a simple RD analysis in which we're looking at whether the trends in the behavior of these things changed after the arrival of an e-commerce. And I think if one were to look at this, it's largely not a big thing. Maybe we can be optimistic about education, but other than that, there's not really something very, very stark. So could there be sort of an iron law logic here? So first piece of evidence of a perhaps of an iron law logic is these people are complained against almost as much as non-newcomers. So they bring new topics. They uh, are different, they are creating turnover, but they don't seem to be cleaner, so to speak, than others. Uh, perhaps more interesting, I like this one even more, is that as they spend more time in Congress, they start looking more than the people, like the people who were there before. They start looking more like other politicians, they start, they start voting more, for example, with the uh, ruling coalition. And we're going to do, as well, the word analysis with the legislation to see if they also start looking more in terms of the, and they start proposing honors and, and, and things like that again uh, as old politicians. Uh, so all of these, we don't have the answer, but going back to the persistent inequality, perhaps as a symptom, but also um, as a marker of something structural going on in, in, in Colombia, we then divide these effects by inequality, and you can see here although there is considerable noise in the, in, the, in the estimation, that if you look at places that are below the average Gini, that's perhaps the only places where we can see some effects, but the places that are above average Gini, where that have high inequality, are places where you definitely don't see any improvement. Um, other dimension of structural factors in Colombia that, are, that is very easy to capture is like you need some sort of functioning state uh, um, to, for inclusion to work, probably. And perhaps the most notable failure of the state in Colombia locally is the fact that you have armed violence. So let's look at places that have it and don't have it. And here the stark is pretty clear. Uh, the places where we don't have as much violence, where we have peace, these newcomers can make a difference. But if not, they actually don't make a difference. That they even appear to do worse than the ones that are non-newcomers. So you know, this is just to provoke some ideas. And I will end this with this. But we think that political systems in Latin America have become more inclusive, more than other regions in the world. This has removed a very big barrier to development and inclusion in the region. And we know that inclusion is key for equality, but somehow that doesn't seem to be the case in the region. So why? So our interpretation of these results is that the success of political inclusion in expanding public goods rests upon deep-rooted social and economic characteristics and things like lower inequality and peace in the case of Colombia, or but more generally having a minimally functioning state, seem to be requisites for political inclusion to be able to, to, to create uh, actually effects. And so in this sense, high inequality is, is sort of a vicious cycle, really, because we cannot drive down high inequality, because high inequality, in fact, is really related with these structural reasons that make political inclusion relatively ineffective. No? One final note is that I don't want to sound too pessimistic relatively ineffective. That is, despite all the advances that we have observed in the region, there are these things where we haven't moved so far uh, um, ahead, right? Uh, so we're talking more about the limits of what this has been able to attain, not that we haven't been attain, uh, attaining anything and that we should go back to the dictatorships of the 70s or whatever. I'm not claiming that. So if I'm okay with time, I'll end there, and thank you very much.